My name is Bill Yarber. I'm the Senior Director of the Rural Center for AIDS STD Prevention at Indiana University in Bloomington. And with me is Jeannie White Ginder, Ryan White's mother. And the occasion that we're here is the celebration of Ryan's uh, life, but also the remembrance of the 20th anniversary of his death. Ryan died uh, April the 8th, 1990. And here at Indiana University, actually tomorrow on Friday the 9th, we're having a special occasion in which we honor Ryan and honor his legacy, and Jeannie will, will be speaking. Actually, Jeannie, our center here had create, has created a, an award called the Ryan White Distinguished Leadership Award in the honor of Ryan and people that have done outstanding work in AIDS prevention. And actually, last year in 2009, uh, Jeannie received that uh, first uh, award, and we're, you know, we're pleased that, that we were able to do that. So now let's, uh, uh, instead of talking about what the situation is right now, let's look back at the very beginning of, of Ryan's uh, discovery of HIV infection. Just tell us a little bit about how the medical community and, and, the, and his physician and so forth, and at what age they discovered that he was infected with HIV. Hi, Bill. Hi. Um, Ryan turned 13 on December the 6th, so he had just turned 13. And it was just a few days later that he started getting the pneumonia. He started getting to where he couldn't breathe. They put him in the hospital. They treated him for bacterial pneumonia, and he never got any better. Finally, they transferred him to Riley Hospital, and there uh, the infectious disease, Dr. Kleiman, met us. And um, they ended up doing a two-inch biopsy out of his left lung, and send, there was no AIDS test at the time. So they sent the results to Denver, Colorado, where the results came back that he had pneumocystis. So um, you know, the medical community was not prepared for that. I mean, okay. they, that's why they were treating him for bacterial pneumonia. So. Um, yeah, things changed, and and after that is when the chaos started. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit, about, you know, about mm -hmm. that. Was um, you said that you know it was sort of new in the epidemic; they didn't have much experience. Were were some of the medical staff very hesitant to to be involved, or were they a little bit uh, uncomfortable with this? Now recognizing what it is, or or the or did you find that that's not was a particular issue? No, it was a big issue at the hospital, and oh. not at first, really. Not, I mean, at first, but the CDC started getting involved, and the CDC mm -hmm. had all these forms, and I mean, there was like 20 pages they wanted me to fill out. Everything we do in our family, wow. you know, and, the, and I said, you know, and they, the gowns and the gloves and the masks all of a sudden started going up in the hospital, and that's when it started becoming scary for me because, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this was like the government coming in, sure. you know, and, right. to, and investigating us, so to mm -hmm. speak. And I, um, I said, you know, we're a real affectionate family. We hug, we kiss, we share mm -hmm. drinks. Mm -hmm. And they assured me, me then, back in 1984, mm -hmm. that no family member had ever come down with AIDS, mm -hmm. and so I had nothing to worry about. So I kind of thought maybe everybody, a lot more people knew about AIDS, more about AIDS than I did because I didn't sure. know anything. Sure. So that's kind of just how the medical, the CDC, the gowns, the gloves, and the mask, that's what's kind yeah, of started yeah. it. Sure. And so you found them to be very helpful and, and very supportive in the information? Or? Yeah, but I also noticed that certain people were always taking care of Ryan. Oh, I noticed they were asking for volunteers, and I did mm -hmm. not know that because mm -hmm. Laura Creech, who mm -hmm. was her name, she always volunteered to take care of Ryan. But mm -hmm. I also had an experience down in the canteen area, Andrea and I both, um, we heard this lady say, I'm not going in that kid's room and you're not going to make me. And I turned around and looked and it was a surgeon who did the surgery on Ryan, you know, the biopsy, it was him and his assistant. And I said, Andrea, I think they're talking about Ryan. Mm -hmm. You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, you, then you start waking up and you start, you, you start mm -hmm. noticing things, you know, sure. like the nurses and, and so forth. And I suppose you then, as time went on, there was a group of individuals that you felt really comfortable with, that, that you, you know, the situation was, you felt safe with on the medical community, who really gave a lot of primary care to Ryan. Is that right? Uh, definitely. I mean, yeah. uh, then you, you know, as more of the doctors there at Riley, especially were 
uh, educated and all, mm -hmm. all that, the, the, from the hematologist doctors to on down. The, you saw a, a big improvement. I mean, then nobody mm -hmm. was afraid of Ryan, sure. especially in the medical community. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, good. Now I want to talk a little bit about some of, you know, the reactions of different individuals upon, you know, learning about mm -hmm. this and you, but a little bit later, what, uh, what's your recollection of how Ryan reacted to, to this information at that time early? You know, I told Ryan, we didn't know. We didn't mm -hmm. know when to say anything. He, I, I wanted him, when they gave him only three to six months to live, I wanted to tell, I didn't want him to know until I felt like he thought he was getting better because I didn't mm -hmm. want to him to w wake up and have all these tubes all hanging out of him and think, you know, oh my gosh, this is it. So we just kind of played it by ear, and it was the day after Christmas. And Christmas Eve morning, he had gotten all these tubes out of his legs, which they were bugging him to death. And so he was glad to get them out. And then uh, the, the day after Christmas, it was in the morning, my daughter was with me, and the minister had come down. And I just thought, I, I didn't know for sure. I said, Ryan, I said, you know you've been really sick. And he said, yes. And I said, well, they say you have AIDS. Mm -hmm. He said, let's just pretend I don't have it. And I said, Ryan, we can't really do that because we have to take precautions to keep you from getting sick. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, Andrea, said, Mom, that's not what he means. And Ryan said, see, Mom, she knows me better than you. <laughs> yeah. He said, I just don't want every time somebody enters a room to talk like, poor Ryan, he's dying. He said, I just want to go ahead and go on with my life, okay? Yeah. Wow. So, And then another thing he said, does Laura know? And I said, Laura, your nurse? He said, yes, does Laura know? Because he had read that people with AIDS could not get people to take care of him, and he wanted to know if Laura sure. knew and she was still yeah. taking care of him. Well, it's really amazing that he was thinking of others. Oh, always. Always, yeah. is that right? Always thinking of others. Always. Yeah. But he, as far as you could tell, he re realized what his situation was relative to the diagnosis. Yes, he yes. knew exactly oh, because sure. he'd read. He'd gotten Time Magazine since he was oh, 10 years old, and I okay. don't know too many kids that read exactly. Time Magazine at <laughs> right. 10 years old. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what was his reaction to... Um, some of your friends about when they learned about um, this? Just hardly any of them was very positive. Hmm. From my best friend since the fourth grade. I mean, her husband said, you know, I don't want the kids around Ryan and Andrea no more. Uh, we just, we saw a lot of it. We saw mm -hmm. a lot of it that mm -hmm. people were just, just scared. Now my immediate family was fine. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were a little nervous about the disease itself and mm -hmm. the kids being around Ryan and have Ryan pass away or, and oh, you know, yeah, sure. I think the grieving process of what, what Ryan's going to have to go through was sure. a little troubling to them. Mm -hmm. But no, I think in general, my family was very supportive, but we soon found that people in the community were, were very distant, um, even at church. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we noticed it kind of at church right away because of Easter Sunday Nobody would shake Ryan's hand. I mean, you know, it was, you could just tell every time Ryan coughed or because he had a, because of the pneumocystis, sure. he had a strange little wispy cough and uh, people would turn around and look and like give you a disgusting look like, you know, like you shouldn't be here. And that was very noticeable. And when you mm -hmm. notice it at church, then you start noticing it everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Because you would think there they'd be even more supportive and, and a little bit more understanding. The, I thought uh, your church would always be on sure. my side. I taught yeah. Sunday school for 10 years, two to four-year-olds, and it was not like we were new members of the church. I mm -hmm. went there my whole life. So it was it was, it was, was quite depressing to Did see how Did that change they, through time, or that stayed uh, uh, Not really, because then right the here? fight to go to school became... Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, a problem and uh, that church a lot of they had a lot of western communities uh, mm -hmm. school people that uh, went there mm -hmm. so it became it came, became part of the battle itself yeah right yeah so let's talk a little bit about uh, how the school and the community responded i mean we've all who've read the you know the story about ryan has really known that there's there were a lot of battles and a lot mm -hmm. of difficult uh uh, circumstances that are unbelievable that you and Ryan and you know my family had to go through, and yet there are some good stories too, in in, in one of the communities. But uh, how did people you know find out? I mean, you, you weren't trying to hide this. I mean, how, but how's the information I wonder got to people about what was what was occurring? Do you recall? Um, 
Well, people ask me all the time, why did you go public? Well, we mm -hmm. never went public, but we really didn't know not to either. I didn't think yeah. to hide it. I didn't think yeah, I had anything true. to be ashamed of. Um, but Ryan, when he was first diagnosed, he had missed two weeks of school. Mm -hmm. And three teachers came down to visit him. Only two, as I remember, came up to the to the to the floor, mm -hmm. and uh, they asked me what was wrong with him. And I said, "Well, you know, they say he has AIDS, but I said I think they're going to find out it's something else okay. because I just I just couldn't understand how my son could be one of the first children sure. in first team of LAX, you know." Sure. And then um, I said, "All you have to do is put on these gown and gloves, and you can go in and see him." And there was this big panic on their face. They said, oh, no, that's all right. I said, no, really, it's for his safety. Sure. You know. Right. And they okay. said, uh, no, we'll leave the cards and letters out. 